Good morning, everyone. Um, so if you are just joining us on Facebook and you haven't already watched the Oaks of Righteousness video that is pinned to the page, I recommend that you go and watch that first. And then Rebecca is going to come and read our reading today from Isaiah 61. The Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness from the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour on the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendour. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the renewed cities and have, that have been devastated for generations. Thanks, Bex. Uh, so, this morning I've been really um, thinking about this theme of Oaks of Righteousness and this um, is something that I guess in some ways has been on my mind since I was in my early 20s. It's a really long time to formulate a sermon, isn't it? Uh, let's not go into how long it is, but a really long time. Um, and so I'm just going to go back a couple of slides here. Um, I When I first probably really read this and remembered it, I probably read it or heard it multiple times before this, and I was in my early 20s, um, I just remember this whole um, verse in, or the, a few verses in the beginning of Isaiah 61, just blowing my mind. And then hearing the word oaks of righteousness, and God really highlighted it to me, I can, it's so vivid that moment to me, I can actually picture where I was in that moment and exactly how it felt. And I just remember thinking, what on earth is an oak of righteousness? And why am I like fixated? You ever have that when you sort of God highlights like a specific bit of scripture and you kind of can't get it out of your head? Well, it's been there for about 20 plus years now, <laughs> where every so often it comes to my mind and I just think, oaks of righteousness, oaks of righteousness, what is that? Um, and so um, when I was thinking and praying about um, what God would have me bring this morning, this came to my mind again. And I've been thinking on and off about this for a few months and it's been really kind of coming to the forefront of my memory and I just thought, you know, I think God's trying to do something here. And so um, I'm just going to really quickly break down an overview of what this scripture is about. Um, so the first verse, you can't see the verse numbers on here, but essentially this is the first verse, um, is it's a prophecy written on Isaiah. So Isaiah, if you've ever read it, this is really far into the book of Isaiah. And it's pretty doom and gloom, Isaiah, to be fair. It's prophecies about the terrible things that are, that are happening and that are coming. And then we get to this bit and it kind of changes tone. And it's this declaration and what we now know, it's a prophetic word spoken by Isaiah. He is one of the most incredible prophets, but a prophetic word about the coming Messiah. And so... He here is speaking, introducing who Jesus is and what he will do and what he comes to do. And so you might be familiar with later in the Gospels, there's a section where Jesus goes to the temple in Nazareth, in his hometown. And this is where he always blows the mind. I love this moment. He blows the mind of the Pharisees and of the people in the temple. Because he stands up and he opens the scroll and he reads this part. He said, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release up from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And he stops there, and he rolls the scroll back up, and he sits down, and he says, Today this is fulfilled in your hearing. Can you imagine how confident you would have to be to stand up? But that is the level of confidence Jesus had. He knew what he was on earth to do. 
And he stood up in a room full of scholars and basically said, I'm it. I'm the saviour. I'm the one you've been waiting for. And so often I've also heard these verses applied to us as Christians and what we then, as Christians, go and do and part of what we are called to do. And that is true. We are not taking that authority from Jesus, but because we have the authority that he has, we too can do these things. And this line at the bottom here where it says, and the day of vengeance of our God, talks about the future when God will come again. So actually this is a fulfilment of the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. Because the day of vengeance of our God wasn't when he came the first time. That's all the good stuff. But when he comes again is when he will come in judgment. So this bit in between is when we get to partner with him, figuring that first bit out, right? We've now got to take that message, apply it to ourselves, and then spread it around to everybody else. Before the day of vengeance of our God. So then it moves on, it says, to comfort all who mourn. So again, he slightly changes tack. It's like, this is who I am, and then this is what I'm doing. And obviously some of the first bit is what he's doing as well. But it just slightly changes it. It says, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, which was Israel, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, an oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And this has been referred to as the three great exchanges, which is beauty for ashes, joy for mourning, and praise for despair. And then it says, they will be called. So these people that he's done this to, that he's offered these things to, they will be called oaks of righteousness. A planting of the Lord for the display of his splendour. And that was the bit that God highlighted to me 20 plus years ago. And I remember thinking, why am I suddenly an oak? And as for this righteousness, let's not even touch that with a 10 foot pole. And then the planting of the Lord for the display of his splendour. To me, that's a quite an overwhelming, guilt-ridden, don't feel worthy enough statement, right? For anybody else, or is it just me who's beat myself with reeds over here? <laughs> so I want us to look at three ways that we can be an oak of righteousness for the Lord. First of all, we have to understand that this righteousness word that a lot of us get hooked up on and stuck on comes from entering into a saving relationship with Jesus. That is how we are made right. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, and we're reading it from the Amplified Classic Edition, says, for our sake he made Christ to be sin who knew no sin, so that in and through him we might become the righteousness of God. And obviously, because it's the Amplified, it's got. So the righteousness of God is what we ought to be, approved and acceptable, and in right relationship with him by his goodness. And this is key. Because when I read that first bit, what we ought to be, I immediately feel guilt. Approved and acceptable and in right relationship with him. I'm like, well, I've got a really long way to go. <laughs> but then, by his goodness, and so the key is, I have to take myself out of it. This is not a navel-gazing moment. We are, it is done by his goodness. God not only takes away our sins, but he also clothes us in his righteousness, given through faith in Jesus to all who believe. We can stand in the presence of God without shame and with confidence because he sees us in Christ. He doesn't see us as these broken people. He sees us through the lens of Christ. Understanding that we are already righteous and accepted by God gives us the strength and stability knowing who we are in Christ. 
So you might have heard Todd say multiple times before that we are, sorry, we have been made right, we are being made right, and we will be made right. So righteousness is a process, but it is through Christ. Our actions and our behaviour has nothing to do with it after we have chosen to accept Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. That is where our responsibility for righteousness begins and ends. So I want that to be really clear when we're doing what we're talking about today. Because if you don't understand that fundamental, if we don't focus on that fundamental, we'll get so caught up in the guilt of it, we'll miss the point of the verse. And the bit that says the planting of the Lord, I won't go back to the screen, this is his doing. He plants us. This is not a righteousness that we do. We cannot make ourselves right. We can't. If it relied on us, it would always be wrong. In Isaiah 61 verse 3, the sense of this idea that we will be the oaks of righteousness is that we will have a sturdy righteousness able to withstand the tests of time, weather, hardship and pestilence. We will endure. Our faith will remain evergreen. The roots of our righteousness found in Jesus Christ will be expansive, securing us against all storms. And we will rise towards the light of Christ as we grow ever closer to our home with him. And the strength of this righteousness stems from the fact that it is a gift to us. It is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Nothing we do and nothing that comes against us can ruin or compromise the righteousness that comes from Jesus. So in the original um, blog post that I found the video that we watched a few moments ago, um, I found this quote and I just thought it was brilliant because it highlights one of my favorite parts of the video. It says, it takes a long time to cultivate an oak tree. This work of transformation doesn't just happen overnight. It is a long, slow work of God in our hearts. And the quote from the video is this, these oaks require years of cultivation because such is the long act of restoration. These oaks only grow from the broken hearted. Their roots are planted in heartache, watered in tears made resilient by storms, strengthened by seasons, grown by great loss, made magnificent in surrender, made hospitable by empathy, and beautiful by sacrifice. They grow in the light of hope. And we too have to open ourselves up to Jesus and allow him to make something beautiful in us. So the second way we can be an oak of righteousness is um, by anchoring our roots deeply in Jesus. There's a quote from Laurie Stanley Rollweld, I'm sure I'm butchering her beautiful last name, um, that I found on Crosswalk and it said this, oaks are hardy trees with a deep system of roots, anchoring them securely so they can withstand many seasons of hardship and storm. Oak wood is known for its strength, its hardness and resistance to predators and other destructive growth. Live oaks are evergreen oaks. Jeremiah refers to those who trust in the Lord as evergreen trees. And in Jer Jeremiah 17, verse 7 and 8, it says this, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green. And it's not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Likewise, the psalmist refers to those who delight in the Lord, as this in Psalm 1 verse 3, it says, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. 
In all that he does, he prospers. And you've probably heard those two verses before. They're common verses, but if you think about that as applied to us as oaks of righteousness, we too have to plant ourselves deeply. We have to grow a deep root system, and we do that through many different ways, but the primary way is to delight ourselves in God's word. We have to root ourselves in scripture. Because you talk about that being the plumb line, that being the way in which we judge how everything else should be. We use that as our measure. And it doesn't mean you have to have memorized a huge chunk of scriptures. This does not mean you have to be a Bible scholar overnight. But it means that you have to go after God in his word. You have to read his word. Listen to it, read it. Listen to podcasts that help explain it if you don't understand it. It doesn't matter how you do it. You don't have to just sit with your Bible open and hope that it all makes sense. That is a great way to start. It is a great way to do it. But if that doesn't work for you, find a method that does. Join a group. Join a Bible study group. Come to seed study. Get in, find a, find a method, find somebody that explains it so you understand it. The point is that we start to understand it, we start to unpack it, so that it builds a foundation, it builds that root system. We all live imperfectly, but as we mature in Christ and rely on the Holy Spirit, we live more and more obediently each day. And this again is called the process of sanctification. So this is where righteousness and sanctification come hand in hand. And I think we confuse the two. Righteousness is something God does through Jesus Christ. Sanctification is the process we go through to be more like him or to be more holy. And again, the same thing applies. We have been made holy, we are being made holy, and we will be made holy. It is an ongoing process. And thirdly, the third way we can be an oak of righteousness is to trust the Lord Jesus. Isaiah 61 verse 3 again says that he will grant us or give us what he has promised. And we have to trust that. It doesn't come about because of what we do. You will notice from that first scripture, it doesn't say, and if. It is, you are. You are an oak of righteousness. You are planted for the display of his splendour. Remember, it's not about us. It's what Jesus did for us. Pray, listen, and know that Jesus Christ has provided this righteousness for you for his glory. As we live in him, we are oaks of righteousness, able to withstand the trials and tests of time, looking forward to the day when we see him face to face. This is what display of his splendour means. When people see us, they will see the likeness of God because we are the planting of the Lord. We are the main way in which the glory of God is displayed. And that might terrify you, but it really shouldn't. Because that's all of us, as we are, in process, working on it, the good, the bad and the ugly. Because we are working towards that process of being made holy. We are working towards it. And we are the display of his splendour. Although we go through the painful process of being changed and transformed, letting him set us free and heal our wounds, it results in the display of his splendour. And I found this great quote from John Piper in the way that only John Piper can do. And he said this, God created the world that he might be glorified by us, which does not mean that we might make him glorious or that we might make him look better. Like he created us because he needed to be enhanced. It's not the case. Don't treat the word glorify like the word beautify. When you make a plain room, sorry, when you take a plain room and beautify it, 
you make it a beautiful room. You don't do that for God. <laughs> Nobody beautifies God. He is infinitely beautiful. That is where it starts. When he makes us to glorify him, we're not making him glorious. He is glorious. What does it mean then? It means you are called upon to display his glory, to show that he's glorious, to act like he's glorious, to make much of him like he's the most valuable, glorious thing in the universe, because he is. We are reflectors. We are images. We are calling attention to God. That's why we live. God is the reason for our living. Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. Point to the glory. Don't improve on the glory. Point to the glory. Enjoy the glory because God is most glorified in you and you are most satisfied in him. And I think we do often get confused by this idea that we're going to display God's splendour. It immediately becomes a guilt fest, or at least it does for me, I hope I'm speaking on behalf of others, that we feel insecure, not good enough, like we're obviously going to fail and that we have to strive to be these perfect Christians who never do anything wrong. Is that true for anybody else? <laughs> we have to understand that that could not be further from the truth, that we are created and planted to display his splendour. That's why we were created. As we grow in our knowledge and understanding of who he is and what he has done for us, our behaviour and actions change. Like the oak tree, we are planted. We need to tend to our roots to grow. We need to make sure we're planted in fertile soil. And then we just grow. A tree doesn't strive to grow, it just does. You don't put a tree in the ground and it's like, oh, it'll work really hard. No, it just does its thing just grows. It doesn't get planted and think, oh no, I'm this horrible little plant who's so dreadful and I'm not worthy and I'm poor little me who doesn't deserve anything good. Anyone heard any plants saying that? No. It just does its thing and it grows and it matures and it's fruitful and it goes through the seasons and some are harder than others, some more challenging than others. Some seasons are glorious and happy and bright and easy but then the harsh winter comes. But the tree's roots are established and they go deep. So they're fine. Winter comes and goes and the tree springs forth life, new life, new fruit. And so the cycle goes on. Think about the cycle of a tree. Right? <coughs> they all go through the same cycle. And yes, someone's got sitting there going, yeah, but what happens when the tree dies, Ruth? Trees can die. Mm. And yes, it can get some kind of horrible infection, or 99% <coughs> of the time in my understanding, which is slightly limited as a gardener, as you all know, is that it's usually something to do with the root system. I guarantee if a plant dies in our house, when you pull it out, it's got no roots. Like zero roots. And we're like, oh, that'll explain why it's not thriving. <laughs> but you pull out a plant that sometimes you think, how on earth is this doing anything? And then you repot it and you're like, oh, it's got this massively intricate root system. So let's not beat ourselves up. Let's not deny what God did through Jesus' death on the cross. Because that's what we're doing. It's a very simple, if we spin, don't believe in ourselves enough and don't even try and see ourselves how God sees us, then we are denying the work of salvation. We are denying the work that Jesus did on the cross. We're denying his death and resurrection. Because otherwise it's pointless. Jeffrey A. Sadoa, and again, I'm sure I'm butchering these people's names, wrote this beautiful um, description of Isaiah 61. He says, it paints a picture of what Christ can do for the mourning people of Israel and the ones hurting today. 
Christ gives a joy that extends beyond comprehension and the surface. He releases us from the bondage that sorrow brings. Our sorrows can leave us feeling defeated. When we fully give ourselves over to God, our view of the trouble and sorrow of life changes. The circumstances remain the same, but we change the glass we look through. God has not promised us an easy life, but he has promised to be with us through each and every trial and to comfort us. There are numerous things we learn only through suffering, but the most important of these is that God is the God of all comfort. God's comfort is unique. It is infinite, boundless, unchangeable, and ever-present. Our difficulties are temporary, but God's comfort is eternal. God knew there would be times when we would be so enveloped in fear and uncertainty that we would lose sight of his presence. We knew there would be circumstances so difficult we would often question whether he really loves us and is with us at all in our suffering. But many scriptures have taught us that we're not alone in our circumstances, no matter, no matter how difficult they are. This is one of my personal favourites, Isaiah 43. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. There is such power in that. Because, I don't know about you, but things can feel so overwhelming so quickly. And often it's my own emotions in it. You know, you get tired, you get overwhelmed, things feel like they're pressing in from all sides. That was my whole sermon last time, last month. But we will not be burned. The waves will not sweep over us. And there's the other scripture, I think it's in John, you know, we are, um, I'm going to get it all wrong now, but he has overcome the world, where Jesus says, I have overcome the world. He has overcome it all. And we have to remember that when we feel like we're going to be overcome. And I say that so much to myself, <laughs> when you just feel like it's all too much and it's just not going to figure it out and is this okay and am I going to be okay and am I going to still be standing after this I have to remind myself of scriptures like this you may have seen many of these um, social media articles or news articles of you know when there's big fires especially in California the most recent one wasn't in California actually it was in Hawaii on the island of Maui I don't know whether anybody saw anything about that a few months ago um, but I've been to Maui and I've actually been to that exact town, Lahaina, um, where this horrific wildfire, it was an old, um, it was kind of like an old sort of fishing and canning um, town. And so a lot of it is wood, which generally isn't good. And you're going to go, hold on, Ruth, you're going to just say now that wood gets burned. But it's old wood. And this is wood that is now buildings have been built out of. Hence, they've got no roof system is the key. So this beautiful, beautiful old downtown Lahaina, it's right on the seafront, gorgeous downtown, loads of restaurants, cafes, beautiful shops. It's one of the highlights of the island of Maui. And this horrific, horrific wildfire swept through Lahaina and completely destroyed it. I think there were about, I think last time I looked, about four or five buildings left standing. It completely devastated the entire main street in Lahaina. And in downtown Lahaina, right on that main street, is what's called a banyan tree. I hope I'm getting the right tree. I didn't look it up. I'm sure it's a banyan tree. And it is monstrous. It is basically like this sort of town square size. Imagine it, it would probably be about half the size of Shrewsbury Town Square. So it's a good size. And if I tell you that that whole square is covered by the canopy of the banyan tree. So just to give you a dimension, it is ginormous. And it's one of the most famous parts of Lahaina. And when Lahaina was burning, people were going, what is going to happen to the banyan tree? Because it's like, if that goes, like that's, that's Lahaina. Like it's, you know, it's gone. 
And I can say with great confidence and amazement that the banyan tree is still standing. And yes, it did get singed and there are parts of it and I think some of its leaves went. But um, experts have come and consulted about the tree and probed it and they know it's still alive. And that it will be rebuilt, it will re rejuvenate itself. And actually there's another fact we learned living in California wildfire area is that we've actually had some wildfires near where we used to live and it happened on this hillside and it was just horrific destruction nothing like what you've seen on the news it was only a little localized one but it was pretty horrific like the entire hill was on fire um and luckily it was put out really quickly and um when you drive through the whole place was just black just black i've never seen anything like it um and it was just um like brush on the side um and grass and then the following year you drove through and the black had gone and it was all bright green. And there's something about that that strikes me in the story. And yes, I know it's not a tree, it's brush and grass, basically. But it's the same principle. That sometimes it feels like we're going to get so burnt, we're going to get so broken, that there's no way back. But actually there's life on the other side of that. There is new life. There is a rejuvenation that can come. And when we have strong roots, and the reason the trees survive is that the roots go down to find water. So that's why in the scripture it says they don't worry about drought. If you're not worried about drought, drought can come. Because I've got the nutrients and I've got the, the, the water that I need to grow. And that needs to be the same for us. Our focus, if anything, shouldn't be on the guilt and feeling like we're not good enough. It should be on how do I get my roots good? How do I strengthen my roots? There is no reason for us to have fear. We are not alone. God has been there for every tear and every sorrow. One of the other scriptures that talks about how God um, carries us is in, also in Isaiah 41. I said it was all doom and gloom, and now I'm bringing out these brilliant verses from Isaiah. There are nuggets in the doom and gloom at the beginning of Isaiah. And, and I, people, scholars are going to like kick me for saying the beginning of Isaiah was all doom and gloom because there were so many beautiful nuggets in it. Um, and one of them is this, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And there's that righteousness again. We're not created to live life on our own. We are better when we are with others. We are at our best when we are connected to God. We are not alone. God is with us. He is the source of all goodness. His glory is the wellspring spring of all joy. For God does for his own sake benefits us sorry what god does for his own sake benefits us therefore whatever glorifies him is good for us and that includes the suffering he allows or brings into our lives god refines us in our suffering trials will always be part of our earthly lives but when we consider what isaiah 61 verse 3 says we have much hope we can throw off our ashes and place a tiara on our heads. I know all the guys in the room are going, great. <laughs> but beauty in whatever way that needs to be for you, instead of the ashes. Most importantly, we can use sorrow to point people to Jesus as we display his splendor with our garments of praise. The verse also gives us hope. It is a beautiful reminder that God can take what we believe to be the worst of circumstances and turn it into something great. And then in Psalm 30 verse 5, this beautiful scripture that says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And you might be like, well, okay, Ruth, um, I get that. <clears throat> Maybe you don't. <laughs> but it seems all a bit negative. Hopefully it doesn't. This isn't just about how we withstand things when it becomes difficult. You remember, I'm gonna have to flip back multiple slides here. 
the end of the section we read of Isaiah 61, verse 4, this is says, they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. And so the reason I really felt we were focusing on this is partly for this verse. Yes, we need to understand who we are in Christ. We need to accept the righteousness that is given to us through Christ. We need to get ourselves healed. We need to be rooted in the foundation of God through his word. In order that we can do this. Because what the bit of that scripture then says is, they will. So the people that God's done that for will then do this. So those oaks of righteousness, you're going, hold on a minute, this analogy just get a bit weird. It does get a bit weird, but we'll just flow with it. How does an oak tree build? Just go with it. It's an analogy. <laughs> so this our oaks of righteousness. We're called to rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated, that they will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. You might remember from the video, it talked about being cultivators. We're rebuilders, we're cultivators. We need to restore the devastation that we see in others. We need to renew places of devastation and break generational curses. We need to rebuild, we need to restore, and we need to renew. And we help do that in others. And yes, first we have to do it in ours. One of my favourite phrases I use, she will know this one, is you can't pour from an empty cup. But one of the beautiful things, and I was just talking to Nikki about this, is that in the midst of our healing process, he brings people alongside us who have the same struggles. Or in an area that you might be okay in, might be where someone else is struggling. And so you can offer some insight, some wisdom, some support, some prayer, some encouragement into that situation. But there might be an area in your life that you're really struggling in, that this person over here has got sorted. How often have you found that to be true in your own life? It's not about, right, when I've got myself complete and whole and perfect and wonderful, then I can go out and help others. Now trust me, I wouldn't be up here leading a church if that was the case, because I'm a hot mess. But there are areas that I might be further along quote unquote, in my journey. But I learn from people in this room on the daily. I love the seed study because I learn around the table. I learn because the Holy Spirit speaks to me in the midst of what we're doing and I learn because somebody on the other side of the table comes out with a nugget that I have never even entertained. You know, that's why we do life together. That's why it's so important. Because each of us have something to offer. We talked a lot about the body and having the many parts, right, and how important they all are. And this is why. We help rebuild each other. We help restore each other. And you do that outside of here too. In your family. In your friendship groups. With your colleagues. We walk alongside others. We hold their hand, we pray, it doesn't have to be literal. We offer godly advice. And you think, well, hold on, I don't have any godly advice, Ruth. It doesn't work like that. Well, you do. <laughs> you just need to learn to know how you figure that out. And for me, and this is, I, how I, I wouldn't say I'm someone who has this great godly advice. I don't walk around thinking, ooh, what godly advice can I give out today? No, it never happens. Um, but there are moments when you're like, oh, okay, this is that moment. I need to come out with some great wisdom. And then something pops into my head that is not from my own head. Right? You know what I mean by that? Yes. 
Some people refer that to your knower, as in you know that you know that you know. That's the Holy Spirit. That's how the Holy Spirit speaks. I think sometimes we expect an angelic realm to come through the door and be like, oh, here I am to declare this great wisdom which you need to impart. But no, it's a thought that you have that isn't your own. That's the main way I would say the Holy Spirit speaks today. You know, a scripture might pop into your head and you think, I'm in the middle of making a panini. Why am I thinking about a scripture? You know, I'm in the middle of, you know, cleaning the house or vacuuming the floor. Why am I suddenly thinking about this? That's the Holy Spirit. That's how he speaks. It's that simple. It's a thought that you had that wasn't your own. And how do you measure it? You kind of go, well, hold on, how do I know the difference if it's a thought that I had that wasn't my own? You measure it against scripture. Is it encouraging? Is it edifying, which means does it lift others up? Does it line up with biblical truth? That doesn't mean those exact thoughts you've had have to be written in that exact way in the Bible. It's, does it go along with the themes of the Bible? That's how we rebuild. That's how we restore. So I want us to go away today and think about not homework, by the way, it's just a little challenge. That we are an oak of righteousness for the display of his splendour. And I want us to keep thinking about that until it doesn't come tinged with any guilt. And I say that because as I say it, there is still a little tinge of guilt that feels like I'm not good enough. Right? I don't know if you're saying that in your head, if you kind of, do you know what I mean? There's like a little bit, like, Ooh, that feels really uncomfortable. But we are an oak of righteousness for the display of his splendour. And we have to get our heads around that because we've got work to do. There is a world that needs rebuilding. There's a world that needs restoring. And yes, we don't have to go out and rebuild the entire world and restore it all tomorrow or ever. But we have a role to play. We each have a role to play. It might be in the lives of your children, it might be in the lives of your family, it might be in the lives of your colleagues or a friend or a random encounter you have in the high street. But we all have a part to pay in the restoring and the rebuilding because we are his oaks of righteousness and we are planted for the display of his splendour. So I'm going to play a song now, which we played a couple of times, but it is new, and it's called Made For More. Um, and it ties in with a lot of the themes that we've been talking about over the last few weeks. Um, and I just really think the lyrics apply to this morning. Um, so we're gonna spend a few moments just listening to that. If you want to join in, you're more than welcome. And then um, we'll get the kids out. 